Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name is Brian, and in this video we're going to be talking about the multifactional theme force Flame in the Darkness. Flames in the Darkness is a theme that blends factions together and stems off some narrative events that occurred in the Iron Kingdom's universe surrounding the Infernal's introduction to the game. It takes some portions of Signar, Mercenaries, Kador, and blends them with some Morrowind and Thamorite pieces. The menu of models you can choose from stay the same regardless of which faction you choose to settle in, but you have full access to mercenary warjacks and can include up to two Signar or two Kador warjacks to bring along with you. The requisitions are mostly typical, uh, command attachments or small or medium based solos, but there are two value requisitions here, one of them being three Marwan Battle Priests for one requisition point, or two Thamorite Advocates for the same one requisition point. And we'll take a look at those a little bit later and speak about their importance to the list. But right now, let's uh, let's round out the composition of Flames of the Darkness with the benefits. Uh, this theme isn't deep with them, but they're fairly impactful. The first being that models in your army are considered to be of the faction your selected warcaster belongs to. So if you've brought Zerkova 1, your precursor knights are considered to be Kador models. This benefit ensures that your friendly faction abilities have a place to be utilized. The final benefit is giving all units in the army vengeance. This is a pretty powerful buff since uh, the bulk of your list uh, build with uh, a, a ton of infantry and your opponent will want to try and whittle those down but they need to hold back since you have this innate threat extension vengeance is one of those abilities that's really great in the early game and doesn't lose its impact in the late game since it allows you to create some new vectors of attack that your opponent might not have seen coming We have a wide selection of Warcasters to run Flame in the Darkness, but Signar sports the most, followed by Mercenaries, and Kador only brings two of them, but they kind of really only bring one viable option for this list. Uh, it's a pretty big task to cover all of those different Warcasters in one video since they are so diverse, so instead we're going to talk about the components that makes uh, Flame such a good list and finish up by discussing why certain Warcasters fit so well with this theme. To kick off our approach to the theory of Flame in the Darkness, we'll look at a few of the units available. Uh, focusing in on the Legion of Lost Souls, Precursor Knights, and Order of Illumination Resolutes shows us some heavy hitters that are stacked with rules. Each unit offers some form of innate protection, some way to project their own force impact, and they happen to come in at a price point that's quite palatable. Uh, Legion of Lost Souls have a way to replenish their numbers through Bloodbound. They have magical weapons and combined melee attack at a base mat of 7 to make sure they can pump damage when they need it. They also have Shield Wall for some added defense, and being undead lets them dodge a few effects in the game. Precursor Knights have Sacred Ward, Blessed, and Magical Weapons, uh, so they can ignore some of those opposing buffs and debuffs. They also have Shield Wall, just like the uh, Legion of Lost Souls, and their unit attachment allows them to move and see through one another, but also pumps their damage significantly with Morrow's name. This is their mini feat that turns them into Weapon Masters, essentially, for a turn. Next up, we move on to the Resolutes, and it shows us a bit more pointed set of rules where they have Execrator on both of their weapons to help punch down those undead and soulless models. They have alchemical masks to stop their shooting from being made ineffective, set defense, and they also have blessed, war or blessed wards to endure better against an infernal opponent or someone sporting some undead pieces. Not to mention they have tough, which is another tick in their survivability box. Holy bonds is another ability that shouldn't be overlooked when everyone else is hungry for souls these days. Each one of these units is stacked with rules that are typically quite useful, and when put into the right matchup, can really cut off a lot of resources that your opponent was looking forward to getting, whether it's keeping your own souls or removing models from the game with Bloodbound. I think now is a good time to mention the Battle Priest requisition here. Uh, one requisition slot gets you three of these guys to plug in wherever you'd like, so you can split them around, do whatever. Uh, these are pretty clutch in messing with Vengeance triggers. If your units are close together or woven into one another, you can let someone sh uh, shoot Unit A, 
to trigger vengeance. If your opponent takes another shot with a battle priest from unit B nearby, then you can just shield guard that and will hopefully have triggered vengeance on two units when your opponent clearly was not trying to make that happen. The battle priest also have value in knocking debuffs off your units with Spellbreaker. Uh, now punching one unit in the back of the head with another unit might not seem like the best use of your time or activations, but remember that vengeance attacks can target your own models, so you have the opportunity to get those spells off without sinking their whole activation. Uh, it's also common to see six of these in Flames list due to the utility they bring. On top of that, they have two attacks for some ultimate value. The last unit I want to talk about is the Order of Illumination Vigilance. This is a relatively inexpensive unit that brings five advanced deploying pathfinding stealth models, uh, boasting an above average defense and what seems to be an army standard Bat 7. They have good ranged weapons with Rat 7, they have Blessed and Magical, but they bring the same perks to their melee and have Gang Fighter to help pump that up a little bit. This unit can scalpel, it can skirmish, and set the engagement line far up enough to dissuade your opponent from moving too far up the table. Uh, this is also a good time to mention uh, Glyn Cormier, the Illuminated one. Or not the Illuminated one, I guess Illuminated one is just like a rank with the Order of Illumination, because I think Harlan Versh is Illuminated one too. But uh, sh since she adds another layer of tech to the Vigilance, uh, we'll, we'll plug her in here. When they're in her command range, the Vigilance gain True Sight, which is quite helpful against cloud strategies, uh, and you can also use it to deal with some stealth models and table side picking, because you can kind of make sure that if there are clouds on the table, you can pick a side that'll ignore them, but protect your stuff at the same time, when usually things like that make it a little difficult if you're trying to charge out with units that don't have something like Eyeless Sight or True Sight. Although Glynn lacks Blessed on her melee and ranged weapons, she does pack a punch as a Mat 8 Weapon Master and brings some shenanigans in the form of Banish on her gun. Uh, now placement rules are not super typical on a model like this, so it's pretty common to catch someone off guard when they're trying to avoid your threats by uh, popping a Banisher shot off and then getting that unreachable piece into threat range of some really nasty charges. Overall, the Vigilance and Glynn bring a versatile package that your opponent can't really afford to ignore. They also allow you to put a unit that isn't of really high investment into places where they just need to exist. Uh, just because this unit can do a bunch of stuff doesn't mean they have to be always getting into the mix. They can kind of swing around and do a bunch of fun stuff on the flank. The theme does have a few other options for units, but I'm going to pass over those since they're older models and have established roles, or are either extremely corner case, they can also come at a high opportunity cost of shutting out other character choices uh, when we get to that solo section. And speaking of solos, the choices that uh, Flames has are where the list gets a lot of the power, and uh, most of it's coming from the newer releases as well. I'll be touching on the heavy hitters here, and we'll be more than willing to talk about others in the comments section below, but I just want to focus on the, the meat here. I think almost every iteration of Flames is going to have some variety of Archon in it, and sometimes both. Uh, since, the, since this is a Morrowin and Thamorite-centered theme, uh, those are the two we get access to. The Morrowind is a pretty decent combat solo, bringing a POW-15 and a POW-12 melee attack with Divine Inspiration. She's also quite tanky at Defense 14. Most of the time she's going to be sitting at 16, though, with Blinding Radiance. And she's Arm 20 with her shield, but she also brings a lot of defensive tech to your army. Now, Blinding Radiance uh, takes your respectable infantry defense of 13 and cranks it up to 15, making it difficult for even Mat 7 swings to connect. We also have another shield guard in the package, so she can pull some small arms, fire off some important pieces, but the Marrowin Archon can also be used as an important piece in that Vengeance game by adding another shield guard to complete a chain between units. Uh, to further explain this, a shooty opponent can minimize Vengeance gains by focusing down on one unit. But a uh, shield guard can be activated multiple times off of one shot. So say a Legion of Lost Souls gets hit, you can shield guard to a battle priest three inches away from that one. And then another one three inches away from that battle priest can take that shot. Then the Morrowind Archon that's three inches away from that second battle priest can shield guard it 
stuff. And then another Battle Priest from a totally different unit can shield guard that from the Marwan Archon as well. And then uh, hopefully he just dies. And then you trigger Vengeance on a different unit that your opponent just didn't see coming. It wastes a bunch of shield guards for that turn. But if this is in the early game, it's really not that big of a deal. Now this kind of setup takes some effort and clever positioning, but it can be quite damaging to an unsuspecting opponent. The Marwan also likes being in the mix since it brings veteran leader for Marwan models, making the most of the of our unit's high mat value. Going up to mat 8 is pretty nasty when you are already coming in at premium accuracy. Lastly, Soulward gives us this 10 inch bubble of soul denial, so that's just another piece in the, in the list that uh, kind of takes those opportunities away from our opponent to kind of get more gains. The Thamorite Archon isn't packed with the type of synergy and protection that the Marwan is, but he is packed to the brim with tools. At defense 16 and arm 17, it's not really easy to take down, but it does only sport 10 boxes, so if something does connect, it's not completely out of the question to drop it in one shot. You should be able to keep the Thamorite Archon pretty safe, given that it's speed 7 with a range 12 bow. Uh, give it, it gives it a large threat ready to unpack as early as turn 2. The bow itself is prone to hot and cold streaks, being a uh, rate of fire D3, but it packs a punch at POW 14. Uh, Murmur, the bow, uh, has a lot of versatility with True Sight added to the Archon, and it has these different shot types we can choose from, the first being Death Driver. It, ha it turns uh, one kill into two under the right circumstances, so you can kind of maximize your output, uh, mostly because infantry that is good at killing other infantry is also good at killing themselves. It makes sense. Eruption of Ash can cause some difficult positioning restrictions on your opponent, ensuring that your pieces get some borrowed safety from the clouds and hazards. Then, Thamar's Teeth can be devastating against our soul-wielding opponents by not only getting a boosted damage roll against them, but also stripping the souls they have stacked on them once the attack's resolved. Uh, and that's pretty brutal considering we have so many ways to safeguard our souls and our opponent's mostly going to be getting those from their own resources. The Thamorite isn't all bite, though. It does give the beloved of Thamar buff, allowing Thamorite models to reroll missed attacks while they're in uh, command of that Thamorite. That does include the Archon itself. Uh, Dodge and Parry are also some rules worth looking at, since it allows him to get into annoying places and escape certain doom from melee. Uh, before we crank down on the super buff solos, I want to look at one of our other value requisitions, and that's the Thamorite Advocates. These models don't look like much when viewing from a general use perspective. They only bring an anti-tough bubble and hex blast, but these pieces are well designed to fight the Infernal's matchup. You might think they are hard to make relevant with only having a command of 8 and only being able to move and apply their buff instead of being able to run at and, and apply it, but uh, you can move up your speed 6 and then reposition 3 to get into some really annoying places and cause some activation order stress on your opponent, so they have that going for them. Uh, barring the gates punishes aggressive masters by increasing their summoning and spells by one while in the advocate's command. But every infernal player will not want to be under this spell, so they've either got to play further back or try to kill it. The trouble with that is that Blessed of Thamar removes one essence for, uh, off of everything in her command when she dies. So having a couple of these jammed into your opponent's army can put them in quite the pickle. My honest opinion on them is the opportunity cost of their requisition feels a bit high to me, and I think they aren't pushing enough uh, to infernal or punishing enough to infernal players to warrant a spot on the front line uh, when it comes in to, comes to army building. I like what they do. I really like the way they look. Uh, but Infernals aren't without the ability to trivially deal with these. Uh, having a pile of Tormentors at your disposal means they can just throw her and not have to really worry about any ability that she has uh, while she happens to be taking out another model in the process. 
It's not that they aren't worth including, but my list philosophy finds them to be too specific and avoidable to really make it into my builds. I like to maximize the usefulness of my models, and in some matchups, the best she is is just a hex blast and a solo that can sit on the flag, which sometimes is great, but for me, it's just not where I want to go. The next set of solos are what really make Flame in the Darkness list dangerous. The first one is a Grandmaster Gabriel Throne. Uh, he's more likely than not to make it into just about any flames list, regardless of what faction you're playing. He is a brutal cavalry combat solo that's got a good gun with Execrator for those undead and soulless models, and Blessed Wards to make sure he survives better against those pieces. But with 10 boxes and a 13-18 defensive line, he's quite hard to pull down if those rules aren't being utilized. The real att attraction for Throne comes from his battle plans. Anytime during his activation, he can give tough, pathfinder, or a plus two damage buff for warrior models. These are all buffs that some casters get sidelined for not having in a theme like this, and he just plugs those holes for the criminal price of seven points. He's ridiculously cheap. If that wasn't enough to really sell you on him, he also brings Tactician for Morrowind models to make sure your turns are a lot easier to execute. I had mentioned that Alexia 1 came at an opportunity cost. Probably not her specifically, but that's what I was alluding to, right? Uh, and that reason, or the cost of taking her, is that you wouldn't be able to take Alexia 3. And her stats aren't really anything to write home about like Thrones are, but the back of her card is jam-packed with power, and you'll want her in plenty of lists, especially if you're taking uh, the Legion of Lost Souls. She gives Undead Solo's Shield Guard, which doesn't really mean much when you're looking at your available models, but her passive Necromancy ability uh, cranks one out per turn, and uh, that happens when an Undead Warrior model dies. Again, I guess. Given that the Legion replenished themselves through Bloodbound, this is just like the clean living Iron Kingdom style. You recycle and reuse and reduce your opponent's army. Unlike her other versions, uh, this comes out immediately instead of needing to wait for her to get it out her next activation, so we've got some really good economy there in terms of not having to burn an activation to do this. Now, we've already touched on why having a lot of shield guards is awesome, but this can also get you a solo for a flag or contest something where you wouldn't have had it otherwise. She does flank with those undead, so that pumps her output up a bit, and she will want to be around those undead because of her power of death ability. This simply gives undead uh, plus two strength while in her command, making the Legion of Lost Souls and Thralls pretty dangerous. If you need to be protective against some nearby magic casters, Null Magic will stop spells from being cast in her command, and that doesn't sound like much, but remember that the Hermit's abilities are magic, so he can be shut down for the most part when it comes up. She does bring Hellfire to throw a damage spell when needed, but it's more of a tool in her kit and not something I'd expect to be casting a bunch. Lastly, her melee weapon has Devour Essence, so if she hits something, the model drops their Essence and Souls. It's really corner case, but it's also quite powerful if it's something that you can unpack at the right situation, maybe when your opponent's uh, numbers are whittled down and they kind of forget that it's something that's there. The only thing really missing from Alexia is maybe Combat Caster, but I think that would just be the, uh, an uptick in her meter to push her over the top. I don't think these two models need a deep explanation, but the theme has access to Ragman and the Hermit of Henchhold. Uh, these models notably bring an armor debuff, so without any input from the Warcaster, we're throwing some seriously hard hits, if we in start including one of these at least. Uh, there are several other solos available to this theme, but much like the unit section, they've been around for a while and have more or less a nuanced place in list building. Uh, Black Bella is a good example where I don't think any Warcaster would really want her, but Fiona can put her to good use as a one-person wrecking crew between the Thamorite Archon rerolls, Curse of Veils, and Killing Spree. Uh, these other options really depend on your list build and what your intention is with them in a pairing. So why is Flame so prevalent? I touched on it earlier, but the solos really make this list, and almost any version of it, powerful. Oftentimes, Warcasters or Warlocks get overlooked because there just is some piece that is missing from their kit that makes them an 
uh, that would make them an attractive choice otherwise, and oftentimes it's usually a damage or hit buff. Sometimes a way to get the army across the table or protected is also something they'd like too. Uh, but with these solos, we get damage buffs, we get armor debuffs, Pathfinder, Veteran Leader, Area Denial, and some corner case threat extension. Uh, the Warcaster you choose to lead this theme doesn't really have to worry about any of that and can just do what they do best. If you happen to have a Warcaster that buffs those on top of that, there's really no such thing as too much damage unless it's really coming into your pieces. On top of that, we aren't taking any slouchy units either. They survive, replenish themselves, come with some innate protections, and they pack a good punch just on their own without any of these other buffs. Uh, POW 12, DEF 13, Speed 6 with uh, Armor 18 with Shield Wall, those are some really nice stats to be sporting across your whole army for not a huge amount of points. We haven't even talked about Warjacks because we really barely need to. Uh, blockaders are awesome, and they do eat up a lot of points, but this list can still just get about everything it wants in there with having one of these huge, huge Warjacks. Uh, we also get access to Gallant, and with so many Marwins around, it's sure to be an efficient piece. There are Arc Nodes for Warcasters that wouldn't normally get them. And finally, amongst the multitude of options, we have the extremely efficient Marauder that puts out a POW-16 Weapon Master hit against other huge bases. And with all these damage buffs running around, that can be quite powerful and take down a huge base in no time at all. Whatever you need, the list has the Warjacks to fill the order. Uh, another reason you'll find this list popping up a bunch is because it is quite good into Infernals. It's not a windmill slam 100% answer, but the list has the tools to make things really hard on the Infernals player. All of our infantry can remove horrors pretty efficiently. Uh, we're not having to trade heavies for summoned four-point heavies. We do bring a lot of spell immunity, and we've got lots of ways, with, ways to deny or mess with souls have a really hard time seeing this list going out of vogue anytime soon because those are all things that will scare any kind of list. Now is there anything you can do into this list? It sounds like it's got a lot going on. Now I know uh, it might you might look at it as like new model power creep or the list to counter the new metal list, uh, the insurmountable demi list that kills the spirit of war machine, but that's really not the case in my opinion. Uh, every meta heavy hitter has matchups it doesn't want to see, so let's kind of explore what those are. There are a few flavors of flames, uh, but there's really one thing that they all have in common. There's lots of small based infantry unless you're starting to throw around resolutes but they have Tactician to help with their positioning issues, um, but you're still putting 30 plus small bases on the table, and it's really hard to out-position sprays or AoEs. Uh, one of the things most flame lists hate seeing is a lot of POW 12 plus rat 6 to 7 sprays or some high POW uh, AoEs. If you can influence the table with lots of shots and spray things, uh, the stuff goes downhill pretty quickly for the Flames player. They often have a difficult time choosing between presenting enough of the army to have threat after running into your guns and holding back to make sure that they save enough pieces to survive past your guns. Uh, if you happen to find yourself going into a bunch of Legion of Lost Souls, uh, you'll find that Remove from Play hinders their ability to replenish their numbers. Uh, Legion of Lost Souls do return to play. They don't make new bodies, so turning them to ashes and dust is going to swing the attrition in your favor. There are a lot of shield guards in this list, but plowing through them to take out, is, uh, to take out uh, the solos can also help tip the game in your favor. I think about half of the casters taken for this theme have a hard time pushing damage, so removing things like Throne and Alexia can give you an advantage. Finding ways to take out the Archons is helpful too, even if it's a bit more difficult. Uh, remember that those sprays can't be shield guarded, so that's another way you can try and start pulling those down. If you can dictate where the shield guards go, uh, and have enough threats to where you can work to plow through them early uh, and hopefully have the tools to bring them down once that protection is gone, uh, the Archons really aren't that big of a deal. Taking down a Flame in the Darkness lists uh, isn't really trivial by any means. I don't want to simplify the counters for this list, but there are some ways to fight back into this meta-bending monster. 
So things that make a Warcaster good for Flames is really just uh, capitalizing on some of the things that the list already does. We know that the list cranks damage and can protect its units really well, and that's really what uh, the casters that succeed the most in this list really want to be doing as well. Uh, taking an example like Striker 2, we're getting uh, a way to further extend our threats we can put out more damage and we have ways to protect our units through decel and rebuke there's a lot of options on his card that make him a pretty strong choice for this one and then we can look at someone like uh, constance blaze who uh, if we're playing more on the living side of things can really get a lot of work out of her feet and soul collection she also has crusaders call to innately extend threat and then repudiate make sure that we can get buffs off of certain things make sure that our units aren't taking a ton of damage if we don't want to use battle priest to do it and having fortune does make it so we can uh, hit a little bit more accurate with some of our attacks because uh, we have such a high mat especially with veteran leader that if we're really wanting to make sure we get all these to connect having something like fortune on a unit helps out quite a bit not to mention she's also pretty beastly on her own she's got a blessed and magical range 2 weapon that flanks with Morrowind, so she's always able to get into places where she can really put out a lot of damage, especially if she's got some souls converted over on her. She becomes quite the monster in combat. Another big popular one is Fiona the Black. Now, Fiona the Black at face value doesn't really seem to do a whole lot, but we get the spell Befuddle, which is just bonkers for uh, taking things out of position or grabbing things from the middle of nowhere, especially since she can basically arc node through anything in the list. And if we're doing that through stuff like Legion of Lost Souls, we can just get that back and it's not a big deal. Or we can do it through something like the Morrowind Archon, who really doesn't hate having D3 damage thrown at them. It's not going to like rain on their parade or anything. Uh, Fiona also has a pretty busted feat for this list because it protects the army so well. If your opponent's already having a hard time hitting your defense 13 blinding radiance precursors or legion of lost souls, they're going to have an even harder time trying to hit that with only one die to hit. She does also bring curse of veils too, and that's going to debuff armor so we can try and we don't have to load up so much on some of those other debuffing pieces that you would normally see in other lists because Fiona just brings that on her own. One of the other ones that is really fun is uh, Zerkova 1. Now she is, uh, she's the kind of caster that doesn't really have a whole lot going on with her with her cards. I mean, she's, she's mostly feet, right? Her feet is ridiculously good for making sure that your unit just straight up doesn't get anything dealt with it. If she's far enough up the table, not being able to charge or shoot or make power attacks or anything like that, it just makes sure that you get the alpha and your opponent really can't escape your army. She does bring Ghost Walk, so now Gabriel Throne can utilize Stir the Blood a lot more than he has to utilize March, so we can make sure that every unit gets Pathfinder where it needs it, and some of those Vengeance attacks can help us get deeper in because we'll be able to give units like Parry. Then uh, she also brings the cloud wall. So if you are playing against a more shooting centric army, you kind of deny a lot of their shooting in the early rounds. And then once her feet gets there, it's just even more not uh, your opponent not dealing with uh, any of the stuff you're bringing. Zerkova 1 is just a really strong choice for this list. And I think one of the things she's always missed the most is an arc node to be able to utilize some of these things in the places she needs to utilize them in. And this list gives you that. If I missed any of the questions that you might have had about Flame in the Darkness, uh, leave them in the comments section below, or if you want to talk about how you've had success going into Flames, or how you've just been having trouble in there, maybe someone else will be able to help you out with that if my video didn't give you the assistance you were looking for. Uh, I am not a professional uh, Flame in the Darkness player by any means, but once you've played this list, you kind of get the gist of what it does. So uh, I'm more than happy to try and help with anything that I might have left out if you're experiencing a very specific issue. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this dive into this theme. Uh, let me know if there's anything else out there that you want me to kind of work one of these videos for. I do enjoy doing them, uh, even if they can get a little bit on the long side. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.